Welcome everyone to the latest monthly installment of the EFF Austin Meetup. Uh, wonderful turnout. I see many faces uh, who are regulars and many new faces as well. Welcome all. My name is Kevin Welch. I am the current president of the board at EFF Austin. Um, we also have a couple of our other board members here with us tonight. Anne and David, they're nice. Say hi if you uh, want to chat more about EFF Austin. Um, yeah, so for those of you who are new and like, what's EFF Austin? Like maybe you saw it on the Cap Factory website. Maybe you're here because Open Austin talked about Leonie be speaking here or any other means you might have wandered in. Maybe uh, you saw EFF boost us on uh, Mastodon or Blue Sky or Twitter or something. But um, anyway, EFF Austin, um, uh, we are an Austin-based digital celebrities organization. We've been around over 30 years at this point. We work closely with Electronic Frontier Foundation out of San Francisco. They're the nation's oldest and largest digital celebrities advocacy organization. You can kind of think of them as the ACLU for the internet. They sort of work to uh, protect your rights in emerging technological spaces, especially your uh, First Amendment right to free expression and your implicit Fourth Amendment right to privacy. They work on things like net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, and just a whole range of issues designed to let you freely and safely express yourself in technological spaces. Um, they're really awesome people. Um, you uh, should definitely give them money. <laughs> they mostly do work at the federal level. We primarily do advocacy at the city and state level. We are actually the oldest member of an organization EFF runs called the EFA, you see my shirt, <laughs> the Electronic Frontier Alliance, which is a group of about 100 organizations all across the country who none of us are formally legally affiliated with each other. Um, this is not some sort of chapters-based uh, organization. It, it almost was, which actually gets into EFF Austin's founding. You can ask me about that later if you're curious about the history. But none of us are formally legally affiliated with each other, but we all um, care and advocate on similar issues. Most EFA groups um, have a fewer resources than EFF, so most of them advocate on particular issues at the city and state level. Um, so yeah, um, we've been around, as I said, for over 30 years. I haven't been around that long. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we've been around. Um, currently, we're primarily an educational organization. We mainly do that in the form of these meetups here at Capital Factory at the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Um, yeah. And, um, and we're always looking for speakers. If you or somebody you know would like to uh, talk or give a topic on uh, digital sub liberties, or it can, it, doesn't, it can even be broader than that. Anything that you think is interesting relating to emerging digital culture, digital technology, uh, especially people doing things outside the mainstream that are interesting that try to promote human empowerment and flourishing. Um, yeah, and in October, we're going to have our board member, David, be talking to us about data cooperatives. So if you've ever wondered what the hell that is, you've seen it in some random thread and like, I don't know much about that, come out and learn exactly what a data cooperative is. Um, yeah, we, uh, we do that. We also um, tend to do a bit of um, city and state level advocacy work, as I said. Uh, we were very involved in the debates around automated license plate readers here in Austin. We were not able to get the city to ban them, which would have been our preference, but we did get much stronger data retention rules around them than would have been originally. We uh, got it down uh, all the way down to just seven days when they wanted it uh, much longer and uh, lost a vote by one vote to get it down to three minutes. Still one of the biggest regrets of my life, but we'll try again sometime. Um, we've also been involved at both the city and state level in giving advice on emerging, emerging AI regulation. In fact, um, our fellow EFA member, Open Austin, who Leonie, our speaker this month, uh, is their current head of the board, um, we've been working with Open Austin on AI regulation at the city level and consulting with city stakeholders and trying to shift that in a positive direction. So, yeah, that's a little bit about what we've been working on currently. We've also been known to throw occasional cool cyberpunk parties if uh, eccentric millionaires in town throw money at us. So if you know any, feel free to introduce me because I can't throw them if I don't uh, have the money. Uh, let's see. I think that is most of what we have going on currently. Um, as I said, you're welcome to speak to me or one of the other board members afterwards um, if you'd like to chat more. Um, we usually go and get a drink in the lobby when our talk is concluded so we can all have a bit of socialization. Also, if anybody parked in the garage, I do have parking vouchers if you'd like to get one from me. Um, and let's see, I think that is most of what I have to currently go over. Uh, Leonie, are we almost ready there? Or? 
You ready? Okay. In that case, um, I will go uh, fetch tech support, and we will get you going here. For uh, our speaker this month uh, is Liani Lai. Um, am I saying your last name correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay, Liani Lai. Uh, she, her. Liani is the first elected executive director of Open Austin, the second of two grassroots civic tech organizations in Austin. The first is EFF Austin. In her previous lives, she was a product manager for healthcare.gov and va.gov, and an engineer for global health medical devices. Hey, I work in medical tech, too, now. Big space. Um, so anyway, uh, as, as you might have heard, uh, Open Austin um, is now the second member of the EFA in Austin. They joined per my encouragement. I'm very happy they are now here with us because for the longest time, not only were we the only EFA group in Austin, which is not that unusual, only a few cities like the Bay Area or New York really have more than one. But what was unusual is that um, we were the long time the only EFA group in all of Texas, even though there's about 100 EFA groups in America. So we had a lot of ground to cover. So I'm very happy to be joined by Open Austin, who we've actually been uh, friends with them through past EDs going back over 10 years at this point. Um, but yeah, so with their joining the EFA, I thought it might be a good time to have Liani come back, remind our constituents and others about Open Austin and their work. So anyway, um, Liani's going to give us a little talk about um, how Open Austin's bridging the gap between high tech and public good organizations and examining what it means to give back and how we can do that in a collaborative and not prescriptive way. Oh, and for those of you who may be aware of history, Open Austin was actually previously associated with the Code for America. The Brigade Network, which Liani may talk about more as well. But yes, without further ado, take it away, Liani. Thank you. We don't talk about Code for America. <laughs> well, we say that word. Though, out of curiosity, who has heard of Code for America? Okay, maybe, maybe we will talk about it. <laughs> um, like EFF Austin being the only EFA member in Texas, Open Austin is the only formerly known Code for America Brigade that is in Texas. So in 2023, January, February, Code for America was like, no more brigades. We're not going to support our volunteer network anymore. We're going to go all in into contracts. Forget you all. And so since then, the brigades or the chapters in Dallas and Houston, College Station, San Antonio, they have just withered and Open Austin has remained. We have nothing to do with their withering. <laughs> It will be clear. So that's a bit of history, and then that's why I noted in the blurb that Kevin read out, we used to be called, but we are no longer affiliated because they actually approached all of the 88 brigades across, or chapters across the nation and said, don't use code for, we're going to chase after you legally if you associate with us. So being very I, I clear was at a sidebar to say that's not cool because that's, it's, to get yes. into our history, EFF was actually originally going to be a chapters award. EFF Austin was the first chapter. EFF eventually decided they were not going to do that. We were the only chapter that existed. They did not tell us that we had to stop using our name or associate with them. Yeah. So that aside, um, that's why I don't want, like talking about Code for America anymore. But I did because a few of us, uh, enough critical mass, uh, had heard of it. So we are Open Austin, and actually, can you all look around the rooms? Any Open Austinites, can you raise your hands? There's Megan in the back in the blue. There's Vic, or Megan she, her, Vic, they, them, with the camera. Uh, Aslan with the glasses and the snazzy shirt. Mm -hmm. And then Josh like raised his hand for a second, but put it down because it's been a bit. <laughs> He's been going to multiple dance conferences lately. <laughs> so all of us, plus these 19 other photos on screen, comprise of Open Austin. That's one full-time staff, that's me, 12 product team members, and I'll go into what product team, what the products are. So six and six, designers, product managers, devs, community managers, three of them, uh, two policy advocates. So community managers, Adlan is one of them, Vic is the other, uh, and then Paul, who is who in real life has a face, he's this pink, emoji, pink icon here, uh, is the third. And then Megan is working on the AI resolution, AI pushback that Kevin had mentioned. Finally, we have two civic tech fellows that are not here, but they are pictured, and uh, I'll talk about our civic tech fellowship as well. Okay. 
Open Austin, we address disparity with technology and in technology. So what does that mean? Because that was just language that you put on a grant and you hope nobody ever sees. <laughs> we serve Austinites. By with technology, we build data and digital services for orgs, community orgs, for example, Texas Fair Defense Project, for example, um, YWCA, they do mental health, not gyms, uh, and offices. We work the Transportation Department of Public, what do they call themselves? Austin Transportation Department. We worked with them two or three years ago as well. So that's what digital and data services means. How do you make, if you, as an agency or as an org, I want to make better service delivery decisions so that I can serve my constituency better. But in order to do that, I need better data. So Open Austin fills that gap. We also do policy advocacy, the second bubble, which is for the public. Um, as cabinet, I, I'll go into that, what that means specifically, the AI resolution, and then fellowships for tech newbies, people who are just coming out of school or transitioning careers or otherwise are interested and have a very basic knowledge of Tableau exists. <laughs> Not that thing I've used, but I know it exists. For loops exist. I know what that means, but I haven't actually applied that in any rigorous way. These are fellowships uh, that we are just starting and just piloting. Right now, we are in week two out of eight and then affinity groups for open Austinites. So that's to improve your craft, to become a better designer and join this group. So that's for or with technology supporting and in technology in which we think that if we're building tech for the public good, then our workforce should also represent the constituency of the nation. Okay. I'll go through each of the bubbles and I should have said this up, friends. I don't have 45 minutes of content in me. I never have 45 minutes of content in me. So I will go through these bubbles. And then at the end, I actually i am hoping to have more of a discussion. I have three questions. We might do a little table rearranging because this like teacher student dynamic is a bit weird to me. <laughs> I am not seeing faces right now, but just lay out expectations, friends. Okay, digital and data services. One, one of our projects we work, or rather products, as long as rebranding of them to product teams, we're working with Fair Defense to visualize the state of public defense representation. Now I'll actually scroll through what the team has built, built in 2022. They, can I auto No. They showed the difference between public defense and privately retained defense. And with our data, the legal advocacy group called... Sorry, I wasn't laughing what you said. I saw it in the highlight, and that's absolutely true. So, yes. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is something that we anecdotally know, that if you are... Kevin, can I curse in this? So, can I curse? Is it uh, um, okay? I mean, I mean I, we're a free speech. Okay, so great. I, guess I'll just say I don't know if you have like a reputation. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I mean, no, so we no, no, no targeting a group, but if you just want to speak, we are five and one, two, three, and we do not attack partisan. <laughs> Even though there's a debate happening right now. Yes, understood. <laughs> okay, so okay, and in plain language, fair Texas Fair Defense, there is statewide legal advocacy group that they know over their 20, 25 years of experience that if you are poor, black or brown, you are going to have shittier representation because you can't afford a public, a privately retained lawyer. You can't pay for a private lawyer. However, if you can pay for a private lawyer, you'll probably experience better outcomes, which is less criminalization, less fees, less negative outcomes that will essentially derail your life. Okay, all that said, the team put together this website that will eventually become an interactive and where's my interaction try it out yourself perfect um like we know anecdotally and experientially that there is a huge disparity but what does that mean in terms of numbers so the team scraped the very archaic court record system and put together this visualization where you can i'm just randomly clicking here because i am not a legal person 
Oh, zero percent. <laughs> oh, all right. This probably means some something to legal <laughs> folks. This does not mean anything for me. But the end of what I'm trying to say is this should work with our data, but also our data bolstering years of what Fair Defense has done. They're able to successfully lobby for a defend a public defender's office in Hayes County to act as a monitoring and evaluation for just random public defenders hanging out in Hayes County. Like, do your job. So that's the impact. That is the daily behind the scenes impact that the team made over the past two years. Another project that we are doing right now is with the Austin Public Library. Actually, I'm doing this bad thing of looking at my screen. There's no good way to position myself. Austin Public Library, their room reservations system. Oh, I'll not pull that up because it's it's kind of a painful experience. If you have ever tried to book a study room, okay, you're nodding, David. Who has who's tried to book a study room? Why? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 like I'm here. Sorry, sorry, the tone of voice. Like, Board meetings. Board meetings. meetings. Educational seminars. Okay. And then with the lovely green shirt. I mean, just, 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 um, you're just a buddy. Okay. David? Yeah. Co working. Yeah, that one. Okay. So, study room, it turns out study rooms are only at Central Branch, and there are meeting rooms which nonprofits can book. So, I don't know, board meetings, gatherings, event spaces, so you can want to pay. But the reservation process is jank. Very official word, jank for the end user, the patron, as well as the code base is jank. Like there's no, it's just a mess of content management and Drupal, PHP all together in one. And so the team is collaborating with staffers at Central Branch to iterate on that. And now I'll show the Figma, which means nothing because they're just tiny white squares. But Jerry had put together a improved flow with improved content, um, giving information to patrons. Like don't just tell them all the policies up front, like kind of stagger the information. The team consists of one product person, three designers, or two designers and three developers, three, maybe four developers, TBD. And so what the team has done, this is a project that is in flight Indigent Stats is also in flight, uh, but that has more years under it. This one started in January. Project board, check. Smooth stakeholder communication, we're just on Microsoft Teams, check. And actually this Sunday, the team is meeting at Mitch. We booked the library room to... <laughs> it's very ironic, every time we book, we're like, ah, this shit again. <laughs> uh, well, so you're personally motivated to replace the tools. Well, well, no, actually what happens is they say, Liani, book it. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll book it. <laughs> you get good at the things you practice, even if you don't want to be practicing them. Uh, so we're building out the MVP. And after we finish the end, they finish the MVP, they're going to be working with staffers on how to make that production ready. Impact number two, public policy advocacy. So. Open Austin, EFF Austin, and a coalition of Tech for Public Good orgs are calling on the city to govern how AI... Wow, okay, whatever. This this life. Basically, in February, the city was like, we're going to integrate AI into our work. And we're like, what does that mean? That's very vague. Could Tell mean us anything. more. <laughs> yes. Could mean anything. And... Over the course of the past six months. Um, yes, it's already been six it months. It has been six months. EFF Austin, Open Austin, um, Measure, if y'all have ever heard of Measure. Have y'all heard of Measure? Okay. They yeah, are, me they're a data org, they're a data org that focuses on um, BIPOC communities. I have basically said, well, what does this mean? And here are the four points that we want encoded into the ordinance because 
departments are not all created equal. Execution is not all equal. So the four points being ensure fairness to all residents across all city operations. Two, consider long-term economic effects now because impressions and day-to-day -day work will change. Uh, three, train models responsibly and not on private information. So if, if this just, this is why we're asking the city, what does this mean? Um, they don't know. In a rush, they'll just take all and uh, train. And then four, be accountable to everyone equally, which has to do with, I'm always loose on uh, point four. Is this the copyright one, Kevin? I yeah, I don't know. One page or... But no, it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. <laughs> uh, and over the past six months, we've been doing two things. One is building coalition with public community orgs like Measure, like Encode Justice, uh, and then also understanding who in the city is a decision maker. Everyone's like pointing at each other. It's not fun to get in these meetings. Kevin is in those meetings. I am not. I don't have the stomach for it. Uh, uh, <laughs> and right now, the team. Oh, uh, to answer number uh, four, we're basically asking for the creation of an AI ethics commission to uh, ensure there is human accountability over these processes. That was terrible, but I forgot. That was I didn't remember until you asked me to look. Ah. <laughs> uh, what we're doing now, or rather what Megan in the back is doing now with David also in the back, is they are creating a toolkit to approach council members and approach community orgs to say, hey, you should care. This is important. How can we explain what AI is and the ramifications in plain language? That's the second impact. The third impact, this is the fellowship slide, Pathways to Break into Tech. I had mentioned that the mission of Open Austin is to address disparity in technology, bleh, with technology and in technology, in technology being a change how the tech industry looks if we are truly to be serving the public. <laughs> and so we are providing experiences and opportunities, uh, professional experiences and opportunities for people who are transitioning careers or got out of a boot camp or from a marginalized population to be able to get that experience to be competitive candidates. They don't have to be, they don't have to be applying to a civic tech org, but I think that all success for one person is success for their community. And so let's try to, let's try to bolster that. And so in our civic technology fellowship, provide mentorship, technical competency, you can read. Uh, this is in flight. And what I mean by in flight is, have any of you applied for grants before? Raise your hand if you, Megan, of course, you've applied. I'm close to be Josh, you grin. experience with it, even if I have not done a ton of it. <laughs> Who has applied for grants? Okay. You know, if our member Heather person. was here, she could tell you all about applying for grants. <laughs> so basically, you have to be perfect in your application, which is hard to do with no money. And you kind of need the money for the grants. But anyway, we're piloting and we're doing what I hate, which is doing more with less. I hate that. I think you should have fair compensation for fair labor. And so what we are doing with two of our students is we're really making sure that the pilot is longer. Um, they have so many references on their LinkedIn and uh, what else? I think references, certifications, and then we're feeding them like a whole of jobs. We, all of us are just crowdsourcing here, all of our jobs, uh, all of the jobs to point them in the right direction. Uh, more important thing as well, or concurrently, is exposure to Austin civics, because something that I realized in the feedback for our most recent grant application was how disconnected the different civic tech orgs in Austin are, or GovTech, or public interest tech, etc. Kevin and I know each other, but we don't really interact with anybody outside of each other, I would say. I mean, we are the main liaisons between our two groups, so yes. with like the AI project, there's some cross-pollination. Yes. 
Uh, the Tech Commission did not meet quorum last month. So which, this, which we were informed is a shockingly common state of affairs. So yes. whatever your opinions on the efficiency of government, well, yeah, they don't make quorum very often, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're very we're we are very fragmented. The civic tech ecosystem is very fragmented. The public interest ecosystem is very fragmented. So exposure to Austin civics means being able to say, yes, I'm working as an open Austin partner, but also here is my connection to like my project is benefiting. And I don't I have a I have what Michaela did. Uh, <laughs> terrible Victor. Um it's not supposed to look like this. She had a bug, but <laughs> not supposed to be all blue. I, I just but, assume you're doing some, you know, graph transformation, some PhD thesis. But Michaela, for example, Michaela is her thesis is if we build bike infrastructure, people will fill to use it instead of we need to show demand and then we'll build bike infrastructure. So we're demand for bikes. So we're connecting her with, or we will soon be connecting her with a few urbanist organizations uh, in Austin, Cap Metro, the, the bike commission, I think they're called, some transportation departments, so that she can understand how to, um, she's fixed this bug, <laughs> after this bug, um, understand how to iterate on her visualization so that it can actually impact policy. And so that is within the bounds of, we're hoping, eight weeks. We'll see how far we get. She's a pilot partner. That's the Civic Tech Fellowship. And then, yes, sir. Question about the Hayes uh, the, engine defense data. Yeah, what's up? When, when are you going to go live and is the data anonymized by the attorney? When we're going to go live and is the data not mine? Did I hear that wrong? Yeah, right? yes. Two different questions. Yes. Okay. So this website is up. You can go to Indigent Defense. Uh, can, I, can I zoom in? Indigent. Indigent uh, Defense. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the very end, I will show this QR code, which has the link to the website. It's a .NET site, and I can confirm it pulls up nice and fast. Good. Um, and is the data anonymized? The data is anonymized for this visualization. But if you scrape, if you go to the court's record system, and I don't know if I have it on my, no, I cleared my browser history. Odyssey. I don't know how to spell Odyssey, that's one thing, one problem. Um, too much information is there. So you have a person's full name, all of their middle names. If they have five middle names, all five are on there. Their height, their weight, it's all, everything is there. Their address. It, it, oh, just freely available. Just freely the available. The, well, dang, now mm -hmm. and and Odyssey. Talking about, about how many civic APIs are leaking uh, citizens. Well, so <laughs> there are no APIs. The team actually had to scrape like. Oh, it's actual web page. Scraping. Yeah, it's a web, it's actual web page scraping. So a bit of backstory behind that. The group that creates these instances, these courts record systems, is called, now I feel bad, but they're called Tyler Technologies, and they are not actually motivated to, um, to make an API because two reasons. First, charging for access, and also the courts themselves are not putting pressure on Tyler Technologies because they earn um, commission, what's commission fees? They earn fees every time you request a court records on paper. So you go to the office, you're like, hello, can I get case number 5,000, whatever, a random number. And then someone prints it out for you. It's $1 a page. And it is in state law that says that's how the courts earn money. So they're not incentivized to change that, to, to open up data anonymized or not. Right. Wow. <laughs> Interesting business model they got going for themselves there. I'm sure it's yeah. maybe three dollars a page for other counties. I don't know. <laughs> Does that address your yeah, question? Yeah, the reason why the question behind the anonymization yeah. is that an attorney of shame is more likely to do a better job for shying away from taking appointments. And, and so, say that say that again. In other words, if if you if you suck in public, well yeah. then that you may be go to buy motivated not to suck in public anymore. Mm -hmm. The reason it works is the only people that are going to see you not do work for your client or your client, the judge who doesn't care because he or she wants the case out of the mm -hmm. docket, the prosecution who wants your client in prison because prison fears addiction, we all know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
And then everybody else in there who's about to get their ass handed to them for an unfair deal because the okay. cops are dirty, they, they cheat, they're stupid. <laughs> I mean, I had one on the stand, he wasn't wearing a uniform, and my first question was, why are you in a suit? He said, I got fired. Why did you get fired? I said, on time sheet twice. Just twice? Well, I think three times. <laughs> so that little girl in case gets dismissed. Mm. Uh, wow. Well, we didn't even get the that substance of it. Yeah. Uh, well, no, not always. It's like 1%. It's an outlier. Yeah. <laughs> Are you but an I, attorney? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I did stay in the Holiday Express last <laughs> he he was at our uh, talk about legal stuff around AI. Mm. But Ace County is just the worst, and I've got my investigators working on a project in other counties that will go in the name where they straight up don't look public in the court. Mm -hmm. They tell you that if you don't get an attorney, you will have to pay advance. And so just sign this piece of paper for the that. point they found on you and go down your way. Yeah. So there's smaller counties. And Tyler Tech is totally enabling this. They've got 7,000 employees. Mm -hmm. And their automated email system sucks. Like, I don't get all the notifications for filing. Well, then we're going to have to have you do a talk on Tyler Tech, I think, at some point in the future. Right. right. Well, as soon as I finish litigation, it's. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, when you don't have a conflict. I know it was law. <laughs> well, we had a Tyler Technologies that, like, employee working as part of Open Austin, and we're like, maybe not this project. And he was like, I don't care. I don't know. <laughs> well, just because you work for evil doesn't mean you are. Yeah. I, I've known many incredible people who uh, have worked for Google and other things. The, the current head of Signal used to work for Google. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like it would be, I just asked, does it seem like it would be a good idea if you want to improve the quality to kind of shine some light on yeah. this? And some of the kind of happens here in Travis County, not as much with Captain S and the Public Defender's Office. Mm -hmm. uh, it does more in the juvenile system. We can talk about that later. <laughs> because it has to be so secret because they're juveniles. I got a case dismissed because the jury room was filled with boxes of old files. And they said, yeah. we can't bring in a jury because we don't have anyone to rip the boxes out. There's no one to try to jury case that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's nothing that does consider. I'm sorry. He was full of this many anecdotes last month, too. I was like, they're all relevant. They are relevant. They are relevant. They are relevant. Yes. What is your name? George. George. Yes. With a J or a G? With a G. Okay. Right. I'm Liani. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, in case you missed that. Okay, and our fourth impact is communities of practice. Let me see Vic holding their hands because this is a project that Vic and Aslan are shepherding. So community of practice, who here has heard of communities of practice before? Okay, I'll start from the beginning. Communities of practice are affinity groups that tie folks together across different projects. So that's not zoomed in. One sec. No one told me that it hasn't been zoomed in this entire time. That's better. Okay. <laughs> so we have our individual projects, which are the blue, the red, the gray box, the green, but there are designers in all projects, there are developers or developers in all projects. And so as a way to create a sustainable system within our organization, how can we, how might we build an organization that fosters mentorship across projects? Mm -hmm that fosters collaboration and learning across projects. And that's what these communities of practice are. Okay. And then here is, that's actually all of what I have to say. So what I should have done is create a slide in between and we will pretend that there is text here. Uh, but before I move on to questions to you, do you all have questions for me? about what Open Austin is about, so what all 19 of us are doing on any given day. Yeah, anybody answer questions for Yanni based on what we've heard so far? Yeah. What's up, Josh? Absolutely. So, as uh, supposing a hypothetical scenario where someone might be back on the job market and looking to polish up some skills, mm -hmm. is, is there anything that's good to jump into right now that's going on with like the affinity group, Amy's practice, or how, how does that fit with um, this sort of like eight week 
Yes. Schedule you mentioned. So I the eight week schedule I think does not apply to you, Josh, because <laughs> I'm guess because because you are not a newbie. Oh. <laughs> I don't think you are new in the field. <laughs> So, he at least seems quite knowledgeable about tech on social media. So. <laughs> Open Austin has <laughs> bi-weekly org introductions, which you can find on Meetup. They are kind of like what I went through, but then the second half is, is actual joining steps, how to get involved. What is your first step? For a data person, I would say it is still, because the two projects are full right now, um, I can ask the indigent courts person, the indigent courts leader, but he messaged me last week and he was like, I'm at capacity. So we'll see. Uh, the main thing right now is communities of practice and what Aslan is working on. I'm going to try, but Aslan, you can fill in the blanks. Aslan is working on making the work that we do that is hidden in DMs and channels and littered throughout Slack and Google Docs, et cetera, into a, uh, a one central hub that is transparent and visible on GitHub. And so he is working out the processes of uh, the user journey of a newcomer to contributing, be that contributing on projects or contributing to the community of practice. He is working on what is a good starter project I working on his many flavors here. Uh, what is a good starter project or a good test labs project if your if indigent court stats or APL are closed? He's working on what is and finally uh, buy-in from the entire org saying like one, I guess saying you have to use this, but probably in a nicer way. Yeah. Is that I, mean, weird? Uh, I would say the, I mean, I, I'm coming from the community of practice or design perspective, so um, I get to be from people who are doing like data or developer stuff, but with design stuff, we're trying to get a regular uh, cadence going for building an actual community. I think after COVID, we had a lot of sort of uh, dispersal within the design community in Austin in general, but also with uh, in open Austin um, and, uh, and like, of the young mentioned um, trying to put together some kind of starter projects to help mentor uh, early career designers and help get people like more kind of plugged in. Um, my experience is that I joined Open Austin in like 2014, 2015, and it helped me get a career in tech started. And so trying to help people who are, you know, uh, interested in civic tech, um, I promise I will Beg us to do a hackathon anytime soon, but that used to be a, the big thing that all you know we did to help bring people in. I think, mean, yeah. Point is, point is, is that we're going to be trying to do some small projects to get people started. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And uh, we have the Aslan. Uh, remind everyone, when are you having the first uh, meeting about that? I totally wish you had left us there. Yes. Yeah. Next week we were having not our first meeting, but it's like our Second, I think. Second. Yes, I believe that's next, not this tomorrow, but next Wednesday. All right. Yes, next Wednesday. So, and that's going to be about design system operations. So. Yeah, and Cherry Coffee House has a very chill place to hang. So, anybody's free should go check that out. And I guess I will just end on that to say that, yes, I think, uh, just like you were alluding to, I think EFF Austin also experienced a uh, community diffusion due to COVID and whatnot. Um, so that's that's part of why I've been intentionally booking cross pollination with groups like Open Austin or the International Association of Privacy Professionals here in Austin, so that all of us who care about these issues can see who's currently in the community and we can uh, remember and get stuff done. I'll also just say in my experience over the years, both for myself personally and others, uh, EFF Austin is also a great place to maybe find out about work in this space if you hear about this sort of stuff. So networking, fun, like minded people, we're, uh, we're happy we're here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to share, similar to Aslan, um, uh, Open Austin is how I got my first job in tech too. My background's in design, but it was with the data science company, and it's just showing up on Slack and meeting people, and it, the job wasn't even posted. I just became friends with somebody, and I'm like, hey, 
And that even the work I'm doing now has been for referrals and people saying the work I've done in Austin. Right, still. Did you have your hand up or are you scratching your ear? Before we go to Miani's uh, structured questions discussions, did we have any other well, questions? But I, I did want, yes, so. and then I did want to address Josh particularly, okay, okay. or Josh's hypothetical person, which yeah, is... Also talk about it if it's, if yeah, it's but um, as Lana had mentioned, communities of practice, I mean, I might as well, community practice, but he's focused on design. I, let's just look at all my conversations. That's Megan. <laughs> Get pictures of Megan. We actually have these four channels for designers, which is a happening channel. Da, 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 da. But also, I created these, shell, these channels for developers, product managers, and data folk, which are all empty. So data, empty. The products, managers, empty. And so what we have identified is a blocker is that visibility aspects. So working with Aslan, I don't, Aslan, I'm sorry. Maybe you don't want to work with anybody. Maybe you're like, Josh, you smell. I don't want to work with you. No, no, if anybody wants to. If, if yeah, wants working to, on that visibility. It's just, and it's just messing around with GitHub. You know, like we're trying to yeah. do, uh, I mean, there's some existing infrastructure on GitHub from um, uh, pre-pandemic, and we might be right something so bad. There was, I think, a shift away from GitHub because we were trying to work with nonprofits, and a lot of them are not super tech savvy. So saying, hey, before you submit an idea to us about something you want to work with us on, like first get a GitHub account, they don't know what that is. But we're trying to also bring out stuff from the Slack so that you don't just have like all this stuff buried in as the only step DMs and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, you can go to GitHub right now and go to the Practice Designers uh, GitHub uh, repo and uh, post ideas for future just, uh, maybe practice meetings. Um, and we're, we're trying to like sort of semi-automate or not, not obviously the, um, there's, you can't completely automate an onboarding process, but we're trying to make it so that there's like a very clear sort of throughput for how people can get plugged in so people don't just like show up to a meetup and then like drop off the face there. We want to like have people like register, like, hey, I'm open to help a project and like, you know, have a little things where we're profile to just kind of like, these are my skill sets. And if like, you know, maybe two or three months from now, a project opens up or something like that, you know, they can say, okay, how many people do we already have in the organization who have this skill set? Instead of, like I said, people just kind of, you know, disappearing into the ether. Um, so. Let's see if I can pull up the user flow that we're just looking at my shit. Um, the user flow that I sketched out with you, Aslan. Goodness. Yeah, we did a goal setting exercise with our fellows earlier. Board preferences, preferences, mouse. Hi, Brian. Hey, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, the, <laughs> Brian and I know each other socially. I feel able to do this. <laughs> okay, but essentially, as a new, as a prospective joiner to Open Austin, these are the steps that I would follow in this new and improved life. And <laughs> okay. Yeah, if I was on the call, I would just say, well, you can be like the GitHub onboarding issue, like just make the GitHub action go onboarding it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they call it <laughs> but the need, the need to succinctly put it, and we should talk after is what are good starter projects for people or good, good test lab projects which for is, data people. Which for definitely be interested in any suggestions because that's like an especially hard problem with design. Yes. Yeah. Like a good 50% of the design in my experience is, a, is actually not doing a lot of design work. It's a lot of stakeholder management and research and talking with users and a bunch of stuff that, I mean, like the hack for LA, which is sort of like a, you know, sibling organization of ours is like 
They, I mean, they have like a huge bunch of starter projects for data people, which is like, makes sense, right? You can just like throw a data set and be like, go make a visualization of this or do find some pattern here. But design, we're having some trouble. And, and if you have the kind of ex like organization that is looking for uh, designers to engage in a specific organization, like, uh, you know, you might be able to find people or, or try to like get people on the stuff, so. Thank you, Aslan. Other questions before I move on to questions for you all. Speaking of your AI project with the city, how do you train AI responsibly? <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a fun question because the way, right, in a perfect world, the city would train it responsibly, but that they would have in house technical experts yeah. who would actually make their own model created from consensual data that is relevant to the problems they're trying to solve. But I'm here to tell you that the city does not have a chief AI officer and has very few staff who understand this. Therefore, they are stuck with commercial models, which unfortunately, as you know, have all the issues with ultimately that's going to be controlled by OpenAI slash Microsoft or Google or Meta or whatever. So yes, it is a thorny problem and at the heart of what we are hoping to get the city to understand it, if you're not going to have this in-house, what need to be the guardrails around making sure data is not getting into this thing that should not get into it, basically. And so if you're... Further interested in that, it's Kevin and Megan in the blue. They're working on that initiative. And then George with a G, you had your hand up. Yeah, how many hours um, and at what cost did it take to develop the engine to the net? How many hours total? Gosh. Yeah. I'm not looking for example. How many human hours collectively, right. I believe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what is the cost, you said? You two I mean, that's great, but I'm just curious what, what kind the of effort is behind it. Sure. My follow-up question is mm -hmm. um, scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that? Yeah, my follow-up question would be on scale. Yeah. Ah, okay. The other 253 counties. Yeah, the other 253 counties. <laughs> so, <laughs> Each of which needs a custom web scraper. <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> I don't know what Aaron Sanchez did. He, was, he did something, and I saw, like, a celebration post of, of other counties. Um, I don't know what he did. We can look now uh, of what he did. I'm curious. What? Okay. Aaron, submit of the PR. He parsed out case outcomes. Lesson. Okay. Well, you can read. I don't know what this means. So basically, the piece of the web page associated with case outcome, he wrote a scraper parser for that section. Yes. And then Jason, what did Jason do? Uh, counties. Amazing. So okay. Well, and Hay is in there. Yeah. But the individual tickets I or the individual work that goes into um, scaling to other counties, I have no idea. I think we're... What I understand is that even data integrity within uh, Hayes County, like the R1 starter county, is kind of hit and miss uh, because they're scraping and then the folks are dumping the info into a CSV and the, the website is pulling from that CSV. Are we confident in our CSV? I get mixed responses based on the time of day. <laughs> So. Well, CSV is a standard and doesn't have any uh, validation yes. built into the standard itself. Yeah, so it entirely like depends on the consistency of the person generating mm -hmm. the CSV data. Yes. And as far as human hours that have gone in, I did. I don't have an answer for you, but I will say that the, where are you, where, this one, this site, we had expedited development on it because of a grant from Microsoft to be able to say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna give stipends to developers. That was a rare case. And right now, so in the frenzy of grant deliverables and building this and making tickets, the tracking of hours fell by the wayside, which is why I don't have an answer to give you. Um, but I will estimate that took the grant performance period was six months. I know they met 
once a week for three hours each. I don't know how much of that was like slinging code or, or et cetera, um, but that would be the minimum. So three times with four people on the team. So 12 person hours a week times how many weeks in six months? Uh, 26. 26. So whatever 12 times 26 is. I mean, it's about 300. 300 okay. human hours. Okay, 300 human hours. Probably plus a little bit, probably 400. Right. Okay. Um, and I will say that after 2022, which is why we don't pursue grants for individual projects anymore, is there's a lot, you have to be perfect up front. Um, and there's a lot of grant deliverables. And the team was so burned out that now, the team now is not the team from 2022. It's like a complete turnover of team members. Well, I wouldn't know anything about boards turning over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, I would imagine, uh, just from my own Mm -hmm. cursory observation that uh, grants are, it's not just you got to be perfect, it's just there are grants are harder to come by period recently because uh, due to high interest rates, the free money in the 2010s has dried up. Uh, mm -hmm. Purse strings are much tighter in general on these sort of things. Does that address your questions as well as maybe stuff you were thinking about? It was. I'm going to give you my card, I got to split soon because okay. I, I do have some other ideas okay. on the same line that you can use whatever model you got here. Yes. Do other things. Okay, well, so so that's why we have the meetings. People meet each other. Indeed. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hope we'll see you next month. All right. Anybody else? Any more questions for Liliana before we move into the structure? Yes. Um, so, Open Austin, EFF Austin, International Association of Privacy Professionals. What are, what are the groups are in this kind of civic, digital civic, civic activism kind of space? Well, if you're talking about, if you don't want me to confine myself to Austin or Texas, if you're talking about just the EFA and the country in general. I'm talking about Austin specifically. Oh, Austin specifically? Yeah. Um, well, the truth is, I used to know of a few more groups, but um, frankly, COVID, I don't know how many of them are still active. I can tell you a local nonprofit who um, who does work, at least in our space, that we care about is a group called the Operator Foundation. They take government grants and they basically create bespoke communication software, usually for journalists in um, in countries' regimes that are hostile to good reporting, essentially, places like Mexico, et cetera. They build them a bespoke encrypted communication software. Um, so they've funded some of our events in the past. They have a board with four people on it, um, last I checked. Um, Dr. Brandon Wiley runs that. He's a cool guy. Um, I'm trying to think about... I mean, they're more at the state level, but there is ACLU of Texas, obviously. Um, yeah, and I mean, there are, there are other activist groups in town, I can tell you. There's like sure. you know, Austin Justice Coalition, Grassroots Leadership, et cetera. They overlap with us sometimes when it comes to issues like surveillance and criminal justice reform and whatnot, um, but that's not their primary bread and butter. I would actually say as far as Keeping it purely to Austin, probably us and Open Austin are the two main people. One, I'm aware one sec, I think Catherine has something. Yeah. Did you get the pregnant? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed the talk. I'd like to say all of them. I wake up from these, so. <laughs> well, there will be next month. Okay. Get, get some steep. <laughs> Good night. Um, yeah, there were, I mean, I've come across, well, sorry, another one. I wouldn't exactly say they're civic minded, but if they're, but they're certainly uh, cut one of our slices there used to be a group called aha or austin hackers anonymous um they they i don't know what their current status is there was also there was a chapter there was atx 2600 which the famous 2600 hacker magazine they had a chapter they were also i think associated with the long term lock picking club um there's a lot of overlap between hackers and lock picking but uh <laughs> Um, I mean, and there's there's certainly conferences that happen here pretty regularly, like B sides Austin and stuff that often attract a lot of the community. Um, but just like in terms of the uh, AI policies and things like that, activism around that, mm. this is the space to be. There. I would say we're the two main local groups because some of the other groups we're partnering with they have chapters in Texas, but. We're the two ones who are like really centered and focused here. If those are the efforts you want to get involved in, um, but yeah, they're as far as as anybody who wants to know more about this in general, especially if they have friends who are moving somewhere else, they're like, "Is there any FA group where I live?" The answer is probably yes, especially if you live in the Bay Area or New York or LA. 
The most prominent ones are probably Stop, Cyber Collective, Oakland Privacy, uh, there's a few, um, Lucy Parsons Project, there's a few others. Specifically, okay, so, so I heard two different things. There was AI groups, and there is apparently an Austin AI Alliance. Oh, yeah. Measure is part of this group. Okay, Measure's with this one. Um, ah, wow. This would be some good yeah. people to know. Yeah. Oh, so I actually, that is a good one. Good Systems is the UT uh, kind of just ethical technology group. Dr. Sharon Strober runs it. I'm a, I'm a postdoc there. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, just, I'm working with Dr. Strober, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's uh, that side, by the way. Oh, yeah, no, I, uh, I've i worked with Dr. Strober quite a bit. I uh, consider her a friend. Um, yeah, and Good Systems is awesome. Yeah, anybody that's know about Good Systems, they're doing great work at UT. There is also a AI ethics meetup that so a guy started. Um, it's pretty interesting. You can contribute to the topics that we talk about. There are other t big tech meetup groups in town. Like I know there's the Austin Forum. There's there's some other ones. They don't, but they they often tend to come at it from less of a community standpoint and more of a industry and CEOs and funders standpoint. So it tends to be less for me speaking from a little guy standpoint. It's more how can we make money from this. Right. Yeah. So when I pulled this up, that's a good point. I don't know from which standpoint they are coming from or if it's a thing that like it's a cool badge of honor. It's a good part. Of, I don't know. As Kevin, you are an advocate as well. Your attention is to be so focused on like one or two things that everything else can Especially when, else. you know, right. especially when like, you know, EFF Austin, you know, Open Austin has Manage to, to manages to have a full-time employee in Liani. EFF Austin is entirely volunteer-based because uh, finding money to hire someone full-time is a Herculean undertaking for any nonprofit. It is mostly day for volunteers in the community. And as far as just civics in general, I unplugged because I was digging through my email, but part of our, no, I need to not frame it like that. This was the email that we got uh, that's explained what different organized civics organizations there were in Austin. I disagree with what the reviewer says, but this is what they said. Mm. So Civ Start. I was thinking of America. I know. It was we got a low <laughs> we got a low score because they're like you okay. We got a low score. They said this is great, but you are doing the same thing, if not worse, than what the Code for America Brigade does. And I was like, we are Code for America. Right. That's not what I said. I said something more <laughs> strongly in my head, but yes. Um, so it is a learning for next time. Open Austin, comma. Oh, oh, no, I'm not reading this, and I'm sitting here going, but they mentioned groups like Atos, SAP, and my society. Yeah. I'm like, I've lived here my whole life. I've never heard of any right. of these groups operating in Austin. Doesn't mean they aren't, but I'm just like, they can't be that. Right. But when we say that decision makers are hard to find, everyone seems to be pointing fingers at each other. This is an example of that, just like misinformation. Oh. Oh. Right. Oh. Well, this, if I were more prepared, would have brought a big post it, like a big paper with adhesive and individual post-its and markers. I did not do that. I left that stuff in my apartment. But I'm curious what community impact means to all of y'all, besides coming to these monthly EFF talks. What does taking action mean to you? And what does doing it daily look like? So a bunch of questions. The backdrop behind that is, as Kevin said in the blurb up front where he introduced me, in which I wrote, <laughs> I said, Open Austin does, I forget, behind the scenes advocacy, or what does it look like to take action daily and bridge high tech and community impact? And so I want to bring that full circle to ask you all what that looks like in your day-to-day -day lives. And um, were you wanting people to try to break yes. into a little okay. discussion? Um, <laughs> I'm thinking on the fly. Who, can you raise your hand if you feel like you are taking action daily? Okay. All right. What about medium? Whatever medium means to you. Well, so there's daily, once a year, and medium. 
<laughs> which I guess is two to 11 months. Medium. Counts as taking action. But counts as taking action. Yeah, I mean, that. well, yeah, it just says what does community well, yeah. impact and taking action mm-hmm. mean to you, exactly. There's this notion that to be, to make an impact on your community, there's run for office, be in office, or donate to someone in office, which is not the only thing. So and I'm, I'll be the first to tell you, many in our community are very cynical about politics, which mm-hmm. I try to fight, but they do still take action in their own ways they believe in, you know? Mm-hmm. Like I said, the email also has. I I didn't think that counts. I mean, you know, I mean, I guess speaking for myself, you know, I guess I could give a seed if that might uh, spur discussion. I mean, obviously, because I do do the work with EFF Austin, um, obviously, I I think I take more action than most, or at least I try to. Um, But I do try to tell people that it, it really, I think taking action can, as you said, it can take many different forms. Um, some people, you know, like to, you know, get out there and engage with their politicians or even run for office. Some people that sounds, you know, either they are cynical about politics or they're, or just, they are not that kind of extrovert and that sounds like volunteering for hell, you know? So, you know, I, I think it can, it, so it it can, it can manifest in many different ways. It, it can be as simple as helping people in your community who are not tech savvy be able to navigate a world that is increasingly essential to use tech, but increasingly dangerous to use tech. You know, uh, getting hacked is easy. Getting misled by disinformation. Now AI turbocharged is very easy. So it can just be as simple as educating the people in your life about what digital sovereignty, what uh, citizenship looks like and means. It, It can also be modeling in your own life how you want tech to work uh trying to use products and platforms and frameworks uh that more envision how you think tech should work like um eff austin we are on mastodon because we believe in federated social media and we think that is a better model for social media going forward so i mean i think i think to me a lot of it is not getting caught up in that if you're not like testifying at a at a Senate committee hearing that you're not doing enough, I, I would actually argue the uh, part of me would argue that, frankly, if you just helped somebody in your apartment building, uh, you know, secure their digital communications or not get taken in by a digital scam, that that can write or help them navigate a horrible government website. That right there to me is uh, taking action. David, did you have something to say? Yeah, I think it's kind of deep there. On most of the stuff you're saying, if you're taking action, it's more like just having a conversation, talking about these problems and issues on a daily basis. You know, like it's kind of hard to because everyone, I mean, this is a pretty demanding world and system that we live in. And so, you know, talking about these things can be controversial or uncomfortable, but that's kind of how they keep staying a problem. So, like, just trying to find time to usually have a discussion maybe like at the break room at work or with a parent or with someone just keeping the subject alive i think is what ultimately snowballs the movements that you see with people discount you know the small work because it's not like the sexy expose large protest movements you don't have those large protest movements or those changing legislation without people just having a regular conversation yeah, and I would say little conversations happen everywhere, all over the world. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was in uh, in France, in the south of France, we uh, were in a uh, what kind of community coffee shop that was so hippie enough it wouldn't have been out of place in Austin. But um, there was some kind of discussion going on in French, and you know I don't speak a lot of French or listen that well. But after we listened for a while, we actually figured out. They were essentially kind of a meetup group like us talking about issues of privacy and surveillance in France, actually. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think there's little conversations about the impact tech has on people happening every day. And they, it may, yeah, it may not be as showy as a big protest, but, um, but it, uh, I would actually argue it's really actually what starts to change things because what people collectively are concerned about, it, society will start addressing. Um, we do see legislation trying to address both governmental and corporate harms 
of technology precisely because enough people cared, basically. And, and you know, I would also just say protests can take as large or small a form as you want. Like one of my favorite things EFF Austin ever did is uh, me and our vice president of the board, Alex, uh, or this was a long time ago now, like about seven years ago, um, the at the time head of the FCC, Ajit Pai, was in town. Uh, we're not fans of his, but um, we did a uh, we did a very nerdy uh, tech silent protest essentially where we went to the hotel where he was giving his talk and we used our phones to set up a Wi-Fi hotspot in the hotel that said like Ajit Pai restored net neutrality. So you can get creative with it. Are you gonna say? So? Are you? Oh yeah. Gesticulating. They ask things. Um, I mean, yeah. I also have some different lenses because um, I'm on the board of a local social dance nonprofit, so like arts community and all this. But like, I think the operative word in community action is community. Um, and yeah, it doesn't have to be the biggest thing, but it's also like each of us brings a different perspective and different gifts and ways of being in the world that other people don't have. And so that means that we can find, if we look for it, a space for us to do the work that really connects with who we are and flows from that and makes the world better because of us being who we are. You know, one thing I would say that, you know, I actually think if you're here and you care about these issues, I actually think one thing that's very uplifting to me about this scene is that I do think you know, tech is the big issue of our time, and I do think these are human concerns because in my work doing this for years and years, off, you know, we've attracted people of very diverse beliefs across the ideological spectrum to our meetups. People who, if you got them on most political topics, they probably don't agree on a lot, and yet they are all in agreement about that they want to keep tech in a place where the way I always put the idea um, is, you know, you. I think we all collectively, we want technology to serve people, not the other way around. And so whether it's a, uh, a government behaving poorly, a corporation behaving poorly, it's the idea that, you know, we're, we're not loving this. We, uh, we like technology, but we think it should be uh, enriching human life, not somebody's profit margin or uh, biased beliefs or whatever, you know. That it actually, uh, well, I mean, I guess now might be a good time, but since we are having this discussion, I will actually read EF Austin's actual mission statement, which is We advocate establishment and protection of digital rights in defense of the wealth of digital information, innovation, and technology. We promote the right of all citizens to communicate and share information without unreasonable constraint. We also advocate the fundamental right to explore, tinker, create, and innovate along the frontier of emerging technologies. Anybody else with thoughts about what digital civil liberties activism or digital engagement with their community means to them? And it's fine if uh, where nobody else does, you know, we uh, these end when they naturally end. But if anybody, especially anybody who's not spoken yet, who we haven't heard from, we'd love to hear from you what your thoughts about that might be. And and by the way, you know, uh, the answer. This is all being kind of feel goody by all means. If, if you're sitting here, well, I don't know if I agree. I'm more cynical, and here's why. Well, we want to hear from you too, you know? So it's not an honest conversation unless we are all perspectives. I could say something. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, my, my name's Johnny. Yeah. Um, I guess like I've, uh, I've come at this, I, uh, as, like being a technologist of sorts. Yeah. Um, born and raised in Austin, I say that because I feel like it uh, maybe helps with the motivation uh, from that kind of mindset of creating things uh, and technology. And uh, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I've not been a part of any of these kinds of groups, but I, I feel like I can be very valuable uh, in a sense of I, I just constantly build things. Uh, and one of those one of those things is uh, building around like private. Uh, I've been a machine learning engineer yeah. since like 2016, uh, working uh, very deeply with language models uh, since that time and been writing a lot about AI ethics is, um, and then building out the technologies for each individual person to use their own private uh, 
private like LLMs, AIs running on their self and, 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 and really intending to uh, create a way that you can uh, have like a ton of personal data, personal private data uh, on your own machine and uh, make personal decisions like database decisions around your stuff. And AI generally works for you, not on the behalf of people. Yeah. So, so at some point, there's like a, a, a an element of like talking about it, and then having it. And I'm like within a month of uh, like provisioning these tools all in like an open source uh, repo for like like when like, I mean, you can see it on just well, start let's, using, uh, let's yeah. talk after the talk because uh, maybe we'll have you come talk about the project when it's done that sounds fascinating and we're happy you're here <laughs> no this has been interesting i came because of the civic stuff someone talked about scrapers and built up like scrapers to scrape the federal government side california state texas state uh, a lot of different laws and then running tests to see if any of the new laws um, pass some kind of like rights standard and then be able to like kind of do a Boolean check to see if it like should be checked, like investigated even, even further. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I came specifically for that that kind of thing because I thought uh, uh, the city tech was very interesting kind of stuff. Um, but like the deeper, I don't know, the deeper motive, I guess, of what the EFF is doing, uh, no, it's, it's very interesting. I, I feel like that I just somehow showed up here. Well, we're happy you're here. And uh, yeah, if I if I heard Liani correctly, they may need a lot of counties who need to have their new springs. <laughs> well, <laughs> so when, you know, you, you said that the, that the the cost to build out those APIs um, has decreased a lot and to be able to automate uh, the, the web scraping process to across each of those, uh, should not be a lot of work. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm not the technical lead on that, <laughs> so let me get your contact. Because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I... But uh, yes, um, I think, and frankly, that ties into uh, another place. What do I think uh, this orangeism looks like? Well, a lot of it, why do I uh, do these meetups every month, even though I have to go through the stress of finding speakers and fitting it in between work? It is. To create a space where uh, people like you can find like-minded people. So I think that I'll find the others as a form of the activism as well. Yeah, just really about community again. It's like because we can't change culture on our own individually. We have to do it with people. We can share knowledge and insights and skills and together be a lot greater than any one of us would be individually. Especially because a lot of uh, online digital spaces and communities are being built in ways that do not promote community. They promote uh, a profit model and they uh, do not promote uh, healthy means of human interaction, to put it lightly. But uh, maybe things like the Fediverse will help with that. Did I say something right there? Campaign? No, I was just pointing. Oh, you're just pointing. No. Okay. Uh, last slide I had. Yes. Last slide I had before we all disperse. Is, Although, yeah, Disperse could just come have a drink with us if you don't yes, have to go anywhere. Yes, Disperse. <laughs> uh, and support local civic tech, and Kevin had made a call for donations earlier for EFF Austin. For us, we are also, so here's a, okay, okay start yeah, from yeah. the beginning. Here's a QR code yeah, how that y'all can point. <laughs> What's up? How do they give you money? They can give us money by going to this QR code, uh, and it goes to this link tree, where you can find the, our open collective. You can also find more information about uh, the event. This is today. This is, let me turn on my cursor. Oh, and if you want to give uh, EFF Austin sure. money, just go to EFFAustin.org. Right at the top of the page is the donate for our PayPal. We are working on creating newer, better, fancier ways of having you donate. We have a new treasurer. We're going to be working on that stuff. But for now, clicking there is the easiest way to give us money. So here's information about Aslan's talk, as they said, the 18th, 7.30, Cherrywood Coffee House, the individual projects that I talked about, so the AI policy, room reservation, um, digit defense, and then the civic tech fellowships. And if you want to keep in touch of how we're, or keep tabs on what we're doing, there's Slack. 
Sorry, that sounded really creepy. <laughs> there's Slack. There's links. You to surveil over yesterday. There's Instagram. So this link tree links to everything. And anyone can just join the Slack. Anyone can just right. join the Slack. Okay. Yes. You can join right now if you desire. Yeah. Oh, I guess if we're going over that, uh, EFM Austin addition to our website, we are we're on um, we are on numerous uh Zybots and Mega Court Health sites. You can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter, but we're also on Blue Sky on Mastodon. We're technically on Instagram, although nobody ever posts to that. Um <laughs> yeah, find us. And so our costs are the monthly costs of workshops. Um, I consider what Aslan's a talk series is doing workshops with the by the venue, pay for food, etc. Web hosting, paying for meetup, that shit ain't cheap. Kevin, you probably know yourself. Yes, I mean we have ongoing. And then they the price hike, yeah. Costs, no doubt. S- socials, annual. We put on Open Data Day, paying for domain names, insurance if we want to grow. Like contractors or contract holders require us to have insurance, and then tickers. Stickers and t-shirts, we have that too. So again, you can go to the QR code. Oh yeah, actually we have swag too if you want to actually get something go to for your donation. OpenAustin.org. They if you go to the same place. Sorry. Um if you for us, if you go to EFMLoss.org, you'll note in the bar at the top there's something called online store. If you put that, you'll go to our page on local company Bumper Active where you can order t-shirts and mugs and stuff, and uh, that helps us. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Not this one. No. Did you know EFF like this? No dash. <laughs> I know. I can tell. <laughs> okay. Here they are. Button there. Done it and on my store. Yeah. Cool. And if you have any qu- other questions about Open Austin, what we're doing, AI policy, there's Megan, also our vision, there's me. A community is a practice that's Vic and Aslan. We we are here. That's all that I had. Thank you all. Um, and so first, I'll say let's give Leani a big round of applause. Uh, yep, yeah, as I said, we're, uh, we're going to stick around and get a drink in the lobby. If anybody can join us as welcome. I also have parking vouchers if you need it. Also, yeah, if you want to learn more about Open Austin or EF Austin, obviously you got Leani and Aslan and Megan and others here. and. For EF of Austin, you got me, you got David, you got Ian, who's also on the board. Uh, come have a drink with us and get to know us. And uh, we hope we'll see you next month for David's talk on data co op. This is Mr. David. Sorry, what? He's with the bread loaf. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, David, back there. Yes. And uh, yes, and David, uh, David usually copiously researches stuff. So if you want to learn about data cooperatives, I highly recommend you and David. It should be a good time. Yeah, everyone, we'll see you next month.